Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, thank you for having us, Bird Theater. Thank you guys all for coming out. I'm super excited to uh, be at such a historical theater. It's a beautiful place, my first time here. Uh, it's also my first time drinking beer out of a sippy cup, and I like it. Not too bad at all. So um, just a little bit about Three Notch Brewing Company. We are approaching our uh, six-year anniversary. Um, we have, our original location is out of Charlottesville, not too far down the road. And we have our second location was in Harrisonburg. And then our third location is right here in Richmond where Willie works and runs the brewery there at the Scott's Edition, pretty close to the intersection of Boulevard and Broad Avenue. Who, who's been here? Who, or who's been there at the location? Awesome. A lot of hands. Thank you. Um, so, uh, we have a new location in Roanoke as well. A brief uh, story of what Three Notched means, and it actually has a little bit of piece of Richmond in the story. Um, Central Virginia, Virginia is of course very rich in um, Revolutionary War history, Civil War history, and one of our favorite stories that we like to tell in Charlottesville is a Virginian by the name of Jack Jewett. During the Revolutionary War, he's kind of Virginia's own Paul Revere. During the Revolutionary War, he got a um, wind of this planned attack ordered by General Cornwallis coming from Richmond, march into Charlottesville to capture Thomas Jefferson. Um, so he, wrote, he heard about this and rode 40 miles in the middle of the night down this backwoods trail to warn Thomas Jefferson of this attack. Thomas Jefferson was able to safely flee west to Stanton um, when he was mere governor of Virginia, and then he later, of course, became president of the United States. So a very uh, important ride and a story we love to tell. Well, the trail that he took was this uh, backwoods trail marked by three axe notches on the tree that later became a major thoroughfare between Richmond and Charlottesville. And in Charlottesville, it is now known as Three Notched Road. And in Richmond, it's called Exactly, three, uh, three Chopped Road. I imagine everybody here is familiar with Licking Hole Creek. They're good friends of ours. Um, if you look on their logo, they have a forest scene. And on the tree in the back is uh, three notches or three chops <laughs> on, the, uh, on the tree because they're off that historic road as well. And of course, they have the three chop triple. Uh, but yeah, that kind of, that story of Jack Jewett and his ride kind of encompasses what Three Notch is all about. Um, our tagline is leave your mark. Um, we kind of, it's kind of a nod to those revered in Virginia history that left their mark um, and got us to where we are today. Um, so, for example, Jack Jewett, we have a beer as a nod to Patrick Henry, uh, John Mosby, and, and many other Virginians. All right, so, uh, Willie, if you want to do the next slide, we'll get right into the nitty gritty. So, we'll talk about how uh, beer is made here. I'll uh, try to keep it around 10 uh, to 15 minutes or so, and then maybe allow a couple uh, questions if anybody has it. But to understand how beer is made, we're going to break it down into four chapters, if you will, four main ingredients. And uh, they are water, of course. Water is often uh, forgotten about. You don't think about the water in the beer, but that's a good 90% or so of the composition of the beer. So water composition is super important. But that's about all I'll say about it because water is kind of boring. So uh, malt, AKA barley. Um, the most important about barley is it's the sugar source. All alcoholic beverages come down to the sugar source. And of course, beer is, the sugar source is barley. I'll explain here in a minute um, of why malt and barley is used interchangeably. Um, so grapes is to wine, potatoes to vodka, et cetera, et cetera. We get all of our sugars uh, for, uh, for barley from, or for hop, uh, for beer from the barley. Um, so uh, let's see, hops. So with the barley, it's very, very, very sweet. And the hops provide bitterness aroma and flavor and that bitterness balances out the barley the sweetness from the barley to make beer nice and uh, balanced nice and drinkable beverage and then of course the yeast uh, the yeast is a live organism and it eats the sugars from the barley and creates alcohol carbonation flavor of course etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, we'll break down the the barley a little bit here with the next slide oh, sorry so this is a, I'll give you a quick overview of this 
Um, this is where we're going to start in the mill. On uh, the top left where the barley is cracked, um, that husk around the seedling is broken apart away and then the seedling is broken into tiny little pieces so we can efficiently uh, get the sugar from the seedling. And then that goes into the mash tun um, where water is made and then the kettle on the, t on the top right where the hops are added. So you got the first three ingredients there. Then the fermentation, which I'll explain in more detail, is the next step. Then the bright tank where it's finished and um, the yeast is separated. It's nice and clear, carbonation. And then, of course, to the, uh, to the drinker there. That's you, apparently, up there. All right, so the mash, a.k.a. where the barley is, um, this is a picture from uh, Willie's brew house there, right here in Richmond. Um, is this the actual brew day? Is that the actual mash from this Kolsch beer, or is that? Okay, nice. Um, so what you have here on the first picture on the top is what we call the mash, and that is the first two ingredients mixed together. So. A little bit about the barley that's in there, one of the ingredients. Um, to understand why barley and malt you are used interchangeably, like if you like a Guinness, a stout, or porter, we say it's very malty. And why that is is because barley goes through a malting process. Um, in a nutshell, to, to understand and take barley kind of back into its original habitat out in the fields, of course, barley has an abundance of sugar, but it's disguised in the form of these starches. So when the barley is ready to grow out in the fields, it releases these enzymes. The enzymes convert the starches into sugar, and it feeds off its own sugar, nutrients, vitamins and minerals, et cetera, et cetera, and it grows out into the field. So what maltsters do, the malt houses, and they do this before uh, the brewers ever get it, usually, um, they trick the barley into thinking that it's going to grow. They lay it out on these floors, these warehouse floors, about a foot thick, so it's a nice consistent uh, temperature, nice consistent layout. And um, so what they're doing is fooling that barley into thinking that it's going to grow, so it starts to sprout, and then it releases these enzymes. Enzymes convert the starches, I'm sorry, the enzymes have been kind of awoken from this process, but then they kill it, and then the Enzymes have kind of been awoken, but then that kilning process stops that growing process. But those enzymes have still been kind of awoken and ready to go. And then the longer you kiln the barley, the more flavor is going to come out and the more uh, um, color is going to come from the barley as well. Kind of think of barley as a light roast, medium roast, and dark roast, like in coffee. Very, very similar. So in this beer, if you guys all have this Kolsch, this is obviously going to be high in content of the light roast of barley. You're not going to get a lot of color from it, not going to get a lot of flavor from it either. This is light, crisp, easy drinking. It kind of gives this golden kind of straw kind of, uh, kind of color to it. Um, so let's see. So what the brewing process is, now fast forward to what's in the pot here. Now with that hot water, that second ingredient that is added, that hot water is now activating those enzymes. And those enzymes are now getting to work and converting the starches into sugar. So that water is also, has activated that process, but that water is also soaking up the color from the barley and the sugar from the barley, the vitamins and minerals, the nutrients, and all the aroma uh, from the barley and all that good stuff, but most importantly, the sugars. Um, so at this point, you're going to have a liquid called wort, W-O-R-T. It's not beer yet, haven't gotten to fermentation, um, but that liquid is called W-O-R-T, wort. Um, so let's see, you want to go to the, the next one? So this, is, uh, this stage is called collection, and this is basically where we're going to start sending that wort through a screen that's at the bottom of that pot there, and it's going to drain into the kettle. But what Whoops, I got my beer and my microphone mixed up. <laughs> um, what that water is there is basically water that he's spraying on top of the barley to rinse through all of those flavors and sugars efficiently through as it's on its way through the barley into the kettle to soak up all that, uh, all that flavor. All right, next one. Okay, so this is the next step. This is the kettle. This is kind of the iconic um, image of brewing. So there's a lot going on in here. First and foremost, we have the water and the barley, that wort uh, liquid that we call. 
Um, and now we're going to add the hops. And again, the hops are uh, add bitterness to balance out the sweetness from the barley. So we'll jump back a little bit. You want to go to the next one, Willie? And I'll show them hops. So bottom right corner here is, uh, is the hops. Um, and they look like a, a fluffy little green pine cone. So you're going to get, of course, a lot of aroma from those hops. And then you're going to get a lot of flavor as well but you're gonna get a lot of bitterness as well. And the bitterness comes from these little glands inside the pockets of that cone um, and these little oils, and they're gonna dissolve into the wort and um, bring out that, uh, that bitterness. So how we get it is pelletized, like in that bag up there at the top, it almost kind of looks like rabbit food. Um, basically, it gets grinded up into almost like a fine powder and then compact into these pellets so we can efficiently get all the flavor, aroma, and bitterness uh, from it. So if you want to go back to the, to the kettle really quick. So back to the kettle. We're going to add hops at three different times to manipulate what flavors we want, uh, what qualities we want from the hops. Those oils that provide the bitterness, they're going to take a while to dissolve into the wort. So we're going to add the hops for bitterness at the very beginning of the boil so that it has that whole hour to bring out that, uh, the bitterness. But what's happening is during that boil, you're losing all of your aroma and even a lot of flavor. So hops that we want to provide to, for flavor, we're going to add at the very end of the boil. And then we have a, an addition in the middle uh, that kind of isolates the flavor. A little bit of bitterness, a little bit of aroma, but it kind of isolates the, the nice fresh flavor of, that, uh, of the beer. But that's not the most important part of the kettle. The most important part of the kettle is sterility um, because we are about to introduce it to yeast. You want to um, jump to the, go ahead, and, go ahead to the yeast. There we go. We're going to, Actually, sorry, go back. <laughs> Thank you, Willie. All right, so we're going to introduce it to a single cell organism that is alive and well and behaves much like us. And we are going to give it a smorgasbord of sugars, vitamins and minerals and nutrients from the barley. And it is going to thrive and create what we know and love as beer. If any bacteria got in there, that would thrive as well and completely ruin the beer. So the most important part of the boil is to make sure the only living organism in that fermentation tank right there is our brewing yeast. And that is uh, the fermentation tank right there that the initial process of the kettle and the mash tun only takes about six to seven hours or so, but this takes about two to three weeks. This is where all the magic happens. And again, fermentation is the yeast eating the sugars from the barley, and a byproduct of that is uh, alcohol and carbonation. So it's in there for four or five days. This is where gravity comes into play. If you've ever heard gravity re um, uh, referred to for beer, gravity is the amount of sugar that is available in the product. Um, amount of sugar, so water is, uh, is zero. The higher the sugar in there, the higher the, uh, um, the gravity. So. The gra that's important because that's how we measure how much alcohol is in the beer. We start with how much gravity is in at the beginning of fermentation, and that's the available amount of sugar that is available for fermentation. And then after three or four days, that gravity starts to drop because the yeast is eating the sugars. And then at a certain point, four or five days into it, that level stops dropping. Um, and that means that tells us that the yeast no longer wants to eat anymore. It's done eating. And what's left is the measurement of unfermentable sugars. Um, and those are the sugars, again, yeast didn't eat. And that's the sweetness, measurement of the sweetness that's left in the final product. Um, yeast creates alcohol at a constant rate. And so we take that original gravity of what was started fermentation minus what didn't get fermented out plug that into a formula and that's how we get the alcohol of the beer is exactly how much sugar it, uh, it ate. Second stage in this one is uh, in the fermentation is called conditioning. That is where all that yeast after a big meal, I don't know about you guys, but after a big Thanksgiving meal, I take a nap on the, uh, on the couch or on the recliner and that's kind of what the yeast does. Um, at that big meal and then we drop the temperature of those tanks, they're all temperature controlled and that yeast goes into a dormant phase and that's why those fermentation tanks are conical shaped um, to help collect the yeast. Then from there, so that very bottom port, we pull pure yeast from 
Um, it's never been healthier, it's never been happier, so it's ready to go again. We'll use that from batch to batch. Um, and then that port that's about two or three feet, two feet off the ground, um, that is, we can pull clear beer from that, separated from the yeast, and that goes into the bright tank. Uh, the final step, nice and clear, we finish carbonating it, and so on and so on. So that is pretty much the process from there. Um, it goes to the keg or can or bottle, and then from there, you drink it. It goes up to your stomach, up to your head, and then the final stage is out into the restroom. That is the complete process of, uh, of beer. Um, any questions? Sweet, I covered everything. Oh, yes. Oh, wow, good question. What's the most complex? I would say sours, um, Brett beers, um, and in a nutshell, what sours are. Um, the yeast that we use, Saccharomyces up there, is brewing yeast. It's very controlled. Um, it's very clean. It's very predictable. Um, and it produces very, very soft, clean, um, sterile, if you will, flavors. Um, sours, basically, so, that, so there are bacteria out there that also eat sugar and create alcohol. Um, two in particular bacteria are is Pediococcus and Lactobacillus. They'll eat the sugars, create alcohol, but also create lactic acid. Um, Britannomyces is another yeast, um, like, the, uh, like the Saccharomyces, um, but it's wild, it's unpredictable, it produces these very like funky flavors. So I would say that's one of the most complicated, those are one of the most complicated beers because you run the risk of infecting all the other beers. They can be airborne, um, sterility is extra, extra crucial, but um, oh, good question. I'd say the biggest chance of failure would be in general cleanliness. Um, and that's really why when at the end of the day when Willie and I um, really earn our paycheck is to keeping the fermentation tanks, the whole brew house actually absolutely clean. Because again, if any bacteria got into the beer and had this abundance of sugars and the perfect temperatures, the perfect nutrients, a little oxygen to keep it going, um, it could completely just, just ruin the beer. Um, so that's probably the most important challenge, the most important trade that we do. We always say that brewing is two-thirds um, cleaning, uh, for sure. Yes? Natural yeast. Natural yeast, like, so like wild yeast? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what he's asking about is wild yeast. I mean, there is yeast in the air right now, and a little brief history of how beer was created, as they say in, in Mesopotamia, I believe modern day Iraq, um, there was a woman out uh, in her fields collecting barley in this big basket from the fields, and a storm came, and she left the basket right where it was and took off and uh, took shelter. Um, and then a couple days later, she came back out to get the barley, and there was this soupy soupy goo, um, barley and water mess in this basket. And I guess they were brave and decided to drink it. And they started to feel a little funny. They loved it and they enjoyed it. And then they started recreating this. And they thought it was a gift from the gods. This was long before um, microscopes and science. Um, so they thought they were leaving something out for the gods. The gods would rain down and then they would have this delicious beer, so they started mimicking that. But yeah, there is yeast all around us, and a lot of breweries, it's getting more and more popular, um, breweries will capture the yeast that's in the air um, by what they're called cool ships, which is basically like a big tank that's all open, um, open top. So, and they encourage, um, they have fans that bring in yeast from the outside, outside air bringing in, and the yeast will, it will start feeding off the sugars and it creates this very like funky, a little bit of sour, maybe kind of tart profile, um, like a farmhouse um, kind of feel um, that this can create. Like when I think of a farmhouse or like a Saison, you think of fruits and vegetables, spices, and herbs, and a collection of all those uh, um, flavors. But again, since it is airborne yeast and it is wild, it's unpredictable, it's very, very, very dangerous. Um, so, and it's just, to be honest with you, it's a flavor that a lot of, especially Americans, 
aren't quite ready for yet. It's getting more and more popular, but it's still people love their clean, crisp uh, beers and all. But it is definitely, definitely growing. Yes? So you talk about three different points where you add hops. Mm -hmm. Great question, great question. Um, so, I talked about, and during the boil, which um, Willie and I's um, boils are about an hour, um, we had a hop addition in the middle to bring out the bitterness and give it time for those oils to dissolve, bring out the bitterness. The middle addition is to isolate flavor. Third addition is kind of at the end of the boil and it brings out more of aroma, leaves a, a, more aroma and flavor. Well, there's a fourth edition that, that he's alluding to that is more and more, most common and more and more popular with all hop forward beers. Now it's called dry hopping. It has nothing to do with dry at all, but that's what everybody calls it is, is dry hopping. So with dry hopping, we're not putting the hops in the boil at all. We're putting it on the cold side and that's even more of a fresh aroma, fresh flavor um, that those hops bring out. So most IPAs now and hop forward beers, bitterness is getting less and less popular now. Everybody wants, when you, we realized um, that if you take away that bitterness, then you're left with this more fresh fruit bouquet, fruit basket kind of quality from the hops and that's what's getting more and more popular. 10 years ago, uh, brewers were making hops our IPAs as absolute bitter as possible. It was almost like a, a competition. Whose IPA is better means whose is more bitter. Um, but what that did is isolate a lot of people from IPAs. You ask most people that don't like IPAs, their answer is, oh, they're too bitter. But now it's starting to get acceptable the past six years or so, it's getting more and more ex acceptable to leave the bittering hop addition out and have a more fruity um, product. So. What you're seeing now is brewers are actually not putting boil, hops in the boil at all, and they're all putting it in to the fermentation tank cold for a much fresher, fruitier, almost like a fruit juice um, kind of uh, flavors, because hops are actually very, very fruity. Um, yes? Lupulin powder is a, is a more efficient way, that's a new product um, that they just kind of discovered the past year or two. And lupulin powder is, um, at the hops picture that we looked at, it's grinded up into a, uh, pellets. Lupulin powder is those oils that are more concentrated. It goes through, I believe, like a freezing process. And then all the leaf matter, the vegetable matter from the hops is, uh, is dropped away. And it's more like a concentrated of these essential oils that are really like, it's a couple advantages of that is it's a little more expensive, but the big advantage of it's much more efficient and a little goes a long way. When you dump all those leafy hops into the beer, um, it's going to soak up a lot of beer and you're going to actually lose a lot. We, we just pretty much count on about a 20 to 25% loss when we add a whole lot of hops into the boil because of all that vegetable, the leafy matter. But lupulin powder, doesn't have that and we get much more yield. Again, much more expensive, but you have to use, you can only, you only need to use a lot less. Um, so yeah, that's just another variation, another process of hops that makes it even better for, uh, for brewers and, and more efficient. All right, uh, I'm gonna let Willie uh, take it away and give a rundown of the, uh, of the Kolsch here and then we'll uh, let you guys uh, get to the movie. Thank you for your time, guys. i uh, just like to say that uh, thank you to Susan and everybody else at The Bird for uh, collaborating with us. Um, this was a really fun brew to do, and I just want to go over the history of uh, Kolsch real quick. So there's a lot of beer styles out there, and we chose one with some historical value to it, something that would be somewhat popular back when The Bird just started 90 years ago, uh, and we decided to go with uh, Kolsch. Um, the story behind Kolsch actually is pretty funny, where uh, lagers are relatively new compared to ales when you think about the history of beer. And back in the day, uh, Germans really take their beer very, very seriously. And uh, there's German purity beer laws all over the place. And uh, lagers were starting to come into uh, Germany back in the day in the early 17th century and uh, so this is a different type of yeast 
top fermenting yeast is ale, bottom fermenting is lager. So in the city of Cologne, Germany, they said that bottom fermenting yeast was illegal and you weren't actually making beer with that. So the brewers in Cologne were only allowed to use top fermenting yeast. Uh, however, lagers were gaining, were gaining a lot of popularity. So the brewers tried to find a way to use that top fermenting yeast that they were only allowed to use and then try and replicate the style of a lager. So that's kind of what we did here. Uh, it's a lot of beers 90 years ago, right when Prohibition ended, were pretty simple. Uh, you know, Anheuser-Busch, Pabst Blue Ribbon, that sort of thing. Uh, Yingling, uh, they were all around back in the day. And that's why those beers uh, are very popular now, is because those were the kind of breweries that survived Prohibition and then came up about. So that's why we went with a Kolsch uh, to kind of celebrate the history of the bird and the history of beer. Uh, so I hope you guys all enjoy uh, the beer and everything, and then let's get to the movie. <laughs>